Okay, this video is the interventions appropriate for the COBD patient. Of course, oxygen, either nasal cannula, one or two liters. You want it titrated so that their PaO2 is around 60 millimeters of mercury if they are end stage. Uh, the Venturi mask will help you deliver a precise amount of oxygen if they need a higher amount without blunting their hypoxic drive. But again, if they have a respiratory infection, we're not so concerned about that and they may need even need to be intubated. But anyway, definitely oxygen and definitely humidified oxygen. Hydration is important, either intravenous or if the patient can take it by mouth. Now we talked about how they may have heart failure and will that pose a problem for fluid volume overload? Absolutely. So these patients are, you know, kind of in, in uh, some trouble here. So we do the best we can diuracing them while hydrating them to make sure those secretions are not so tenacious and thick. That's why we need to hydrate them. Small frequent meals, especially if they're really short of breath. Um, and so with each meal, they're not able to take in sufficient calories. So making sure that they are nutrient dense meals with sufficient amounts of protein so they don't get protein malnourished low carbohydrates because in the system carbohydrates are turned into um, carbon dioxide and then their co2 levels will be even higher so low carb diets for these pulmonary patients chest physiotherapy for the most part is done by respiratory therapy but we need to kind of be in the know about what they're doing and we are also able to facilitate some of what they do, but not necessarily as, um, as sophisticated as what they do. So um, something called postural drainage will allow the patient to assume various positions, and I just did little samples here, so that the secretions are able to drain into the larger airways and it's easier to expectorate that way. And um, a lot of times while they are in these positions where the secretions, secretions are draining, that's when the um, percussion can be done and the vibration can be done. And generally the vibration is done by a machine and this will also help mobilize the secretions in order to be easier to expectorate. Coughing, we can teach the patient, you know, coughing, little coughs and then a big cough to get their secretions up and generally that's easier when the patient's sitting upright. Whatever has a T here means that this is stuff that we need to make sure that we're teaching the patient so they're in the know about their own care. Tripod positioning is something that the patient can assume on their own. It's easier to breathe when they're sitting upright and also leaning forward a little bit. Purse lip breathing is when the patient takes a breath in and then has a prolonged exhalation while they're assuming what's called purse lipped. And it looks like this. And it's just a prolonged exhalation to, for one thing, calm down. A lot of times these patients that have such trouble breathing are really anxious and they're really not focusing on their breathing like they need to. And while they're exhaling through purse, lipped, purse lips, it helps, um, it helps facilitate exhalation of their CO2. Medications, okay, so if a patient is admitted through the emergency department with exacerbation of their COPD, generally that means that they have an infection, that they've acquired pneumonia, and they don't have any reserve in terms of oxygenation. So antibiotics need to be started immediately before any kind of cultures come back so that at least that can start to cook a little bit and then sputum cultures will be drawn so the more precise antibiotic can be administered. The small volume nebulizer is the little um, breathing treatment that the respiratory therapy is able to administer to patients. And generally, unless uh, the patient gets too tachycardic, it will be a combination of both the beta-2 agonist 
and an anticholinergic. So what does that mean? A beta-2 agonist is a sympathomimetic. In other words, it mimics the effects of the sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system. So that is able to stimulate receptor sites on the bronchioles, which will cause bronchodilation. That in combination with an anticholinergic, so an anticholinergic will block the effects of the acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter on the parasympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system. So if you block the parasympathetic innervation, you will allow bronchodilation of those bronchioles. So one stimulates those receptor sites on the bronchioles and the other one blocks innervation of the um, side of the autonomic that could cause bronchoconstriction. So generally it's uh, atrovent combined with albuterol, ventolin type beta-2 agonists. There are short-acting beta agonists like the albuterol is, and there also is the long-acting beta-2 agonists like salmeterol. Corticosteroids is often a mainstay of treatment. Remember, these uh, stabilize mast cells, so it will decrease the amount of mucus that's produced. It will decrease bronchospastic airway. It's either administered the, via the meter dose inhaler, and be sure that they, if they are using an inhaler for corticosteroids, that the inhaler of a beta-2 agonist is administered first, so their airways are going to be out. Steroids are often given intravenously and sometimes even PO. Sometimes they're given um, the steroids to take home, and sometimes they're not. So it's really um, very individual. And as we know, steroids are associated with a lot of side effects, you know, hyperglycemia, uh, suppressed immune response. So we try to minimize it unless the, patient, the benefit outweighs the risk for the patient. The methoxanthines or the xanthines would be like P.O. Theodore or IV aminophilin. It's really the same drug, but a different route. And this um, will increase levels of something called cyclic AMP, which actually helps the smooth muscles of the bronchioles relax. So this was more of a mainstay of treatment back in the day, but it's still um, still out there, so it's, it's a good idea to be familiar with it. Now, the methyl, methylxanthines are chemically very similar to caffeine. So, what does that mean for the patient? Well, first of all, they're going to be a little bit hyper. Second of all, they are going to have an increased heart rate, which is also a side effect of the sympathomimetic and the anticholinergic. So tachycardia is something that is a side effect of the SVN treatments and the methylxanthine drugs. And thirdly, just like caffeine does, it will dilate the renal artery, increasing urine output. So tachycardia, increased urine output, and jitteriness is, uh, are the side effects of these methylxanthines. And that's probably why we see less and less of them in use. Mucolytics are a great way to try to um, thin the secretions and make them easier to mobilize.